Since most of us didn't grow up in the era of widespread electric vehicles, shout out here to anyone in the roughly 130 year old range, those of us who've switched from electric vehicles have generally had to learn the slightly different skill set required to use one. It's something that we grow accustomed to, not something that we've grown up with. And that's unlike gas cars, which have had a massive place in popular culture. Uh, excuse me. I'll have four whole fried chickens and a Coke. And my friend here will have white bread toasted. And that can be quite intimidating to folks, particularly as we work our way towards mainstream vehicle adoption. More and more people who aren't deeply interested in the technology, who just want a car that's awesome, reliable, and environmentally less impactful, are making that switch. But as a kid, you probably absorbed the knowledge of how gas stations work and all the little bits and pieces that go into driving and looking after a petrol powered car. They, they were all absorbed kind of by osmosis or in driver's ed lessons. It's something that you've either experienced as you grew up or something that at least you saw on TV and in movies. But EVs? Well, modern EVs haven't been around long enough to have that impact. And there are two questions we get a lot about using EVs. Two of the most common ones are, where do you charge? And how do you charge? And today we're going to cover part of that. Today, we're going to talk about home charging. But before I get started, I am not a qualified electrician. And you should most definitely consult one before doing anything I suggest. I mean, really, if you're following advice from videos on YouTube about how to wire your home, well, anyway, talk to an electrician and don't be touching anything that you don't know how to touch safely. An adage that's true about pretty much everything in life. So let's start at the top. There's home charging, which is what we'll talk about today. And then there's charging when you're not at home, whether that's using something which seems kind of similar to what you have at home while you're out and about at the mall or at a farmer's market or rapid charging when you're on a long distance trip, which can also be in those same places or at some kind of big charging plaza. Those we're going to be talking about in an upcoming video, but not today. Today, we're going to talk about the place most EV owners charge most of the time. See, one of the biggest differences between gas cars and EVs is if you have charging at home, you get to leave the house every day with a full tank of electrons. And no, I know, it's not a tank. And never mind. You can potentially leave home with your car fully charged every day as to whether you should or whether you should set the limit on your car to less than fully charged for regular use, well, that's for another video. We actually made a video on that quite a while back, which I won't link to right now because it really needs an update. So that's coming. As to how you wind up with that full tank of electrons, well, you do that using one of these. You might think, why isn't she calling it a charger? And I probably will at some point, because I do at home, because I am linguistically lazy, but to call it a charger is actually a misnomer. That's because all this box is, really, is a fancy electronically controlled switch, a relay, and the various gubbins to tell it when to turn that posh switch on and off to connect the power directly from the outlet to the vehicle. Its proper name, and we all know how important propriety is, is an EVSE. That catchy acronym stands for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. The actual charger itself is under the hood or somewhere else in the car, but all this box is, is a connection to the mains. Just to make things more complicated, when you're fast charging, such as on a road trip, the thing you are using there is a charger, but this isn't. Believe it or not, fueling with petrol was pretty confusing in the early days of internal combustion cars too. That being said, and this being such a simple lump of plastic, why does it matter which one you buy? 
Well, there are different ones with varying capabilities and it's important to pick one that's appropriate for your needs. Not only that, but particularly as electric vehicles get bigger batteries, the amount of energy it takes to fill that battery up increases. So trying to make do with the granny cable that came with the car might well lead to problems. But since we've mentioned it, and assuming your car came with all the bits and bobs that it shipped with new, the chances are your EV or PHEV came with a cable like this one that plugs into a regular wall socket. Some manufacturers like Nissan actually include a much more capable one, but this here is the most basic of basic plugs. This type of EVSE is, in the United States at least, generally limited to around 8 amps or 10 amps at 120-ish volts, which works out to around 1.5 kilowatts. Using one of these will give you, unless you have something that's remarkably outside the normal bell curve of efficiency for an EV, about three to maybe five miles for every hour that the car is on charge. This is called a level one EVSE. We're not going to worry about the level one bit right now because the nomenclature of EV charging is frankly a right mess. Instead, we'll talk practicalities. So since the US is the biggest market in which these one and a half kilowatt chargers are used, let's imagine that you commute 16 miles, which is pretty typical for an American. In a moment, we'll talk about the somewhat faster granny leads that you get somewhere else in the world, but for the moment, we'll stick with America. So your 16 mile commute. In that case, assuming that you can plug your car into charge for at least five and a half hours overnight, you can, in theory, live with the cable that came with your car. But if, like I was a while back, you're commuting 50 miles a day and have fewer than 10 hours between those trips, then you're not going to be able to do that on the granny lead. Now, I say you can live with it for a short commute, but there are a few caveats to that, which I'll come to in a moment. After we have a quick chat about places in which there are more volts and more amps out of a regular household socket. In New Zealand, India, Australia, and Europe, and frankly, a bunch of other places, Thanks to the higher supply voltage and outlets that are somewhat more sturdy, you'll typically get around 12-ish amps at 230-ish volts as your granny lead. That will vary a bit by country and plug, but that nets you around 3 kilowatts, which gives you more than 10 miles per hour for charging a typical EV. If you're plugging in your Porsche Taycan, then you probably get a fair bit less. But really, if that's your use case, buy a better EVSE. For those of us in the US, you can buy a very similar EVSE at disconcertingly low prices from a multitude of Chinese companies. And if you've got a dead one, please let us know. We want one. You can also buy some rather more well-made ones, which are often also made in China, but with better quality control. In the US, these plug into a dryer type outlet, either a NEMA 1430, 1440, or a 1450. An overnight charge on a 12 amp EVSE means that you could reasonably put 100 miles worth of charge into your car's battery overnight. For the vast majority of people, that's going to be more than enough for day-to-day -day use. Oh, and should you be interested, these are called level two EVSEs. So if you can live with the free EVSE that came with your car, then why would you want to consider something more? Well, first up, and this is where we come to the caveats on those free EVSEs that come with your car, they are in general not designed for day-to-day -day use. And sockets on the outside of the house or located in garages are often not, shall we say, in the best shape. Constantly drawing near the maximum allowable current from a grotty damp socket with corroded connectors is a fairly quick way to have some fairly profound electrical problems. And constantly plugging in and unplugging the cable from the outlet is going to slowly, gradually make the contacts less good, increasing the chance of heat damage at the house end of the charging system. Also, constantly plugging in and unplugging the cable will probably slowly damage the wires inside the cable. And finally, while these are water resistant, some of the cheaper ones are definitely not truly waterproof, 
nor are they impact rated, so there's a good chance that running over the control box or dropping it, which is definitely a risk with some of the ones I've seen, is going to lead to permanent damage. So, what should you do? Well, if you can, we recommend getting a good quality level 2 charger permanently installed. Whether that be with a dedicated outlet into which it's plugged permanently, which is what we did here, or whether it's permanently wired in, which is what Nikki has at her house. If you rent or don't have space on your distribution board or in your breaker box for a dedicated outlet, we covered the Neo Charge in a video, which we'll link to below, which does allow you to use one socket and automatically switch over between a charger and a dryer, or between two chargers. Personally, for the sake of future proofing, I'd recommend something around at least 7 kilowatts. but in Europe, if you have 3-phase power available, you can go up to 22 kilowatts at home. Similarly, the Ford F-150 pickup will come with an optional 80 amp charger, which will be around 20 kilowatts from the 2-phase electrical supply that's typical in US homes. Either one of these could net you 70 to 80 miles per hour of charging, but, and this is a big but, Many EVs cannot make use of that extra capacity and are limited to 11 kilowatts or fewer, at least at the moment. Which is why, for the moment at least, 7 to 11 kilowatts is fine for the vast majority of folks, unless you're driving something inefficient or large a long way very frequently. It also is useful to know that EVSEs are often sold by amp rating rather than by power or kilowatt rating. For 7 to 11 kilowatts, you're looking at around 32 to 40 amps in common EVSE advertising descriptors. A 16 amp one, which is what you'll often see on Wish or Banggood or eBay, that's around 3 kilowatts, which, as I said earlier, may well be enough for many folks, but you want to be sure that it's a good quality one. So how do you choose a good quality EVSE? First, choose a reputable company. The one that's sold under 20 different brand names with no obvious maker that costs 100 bucks from AliExpress? Probably not the one you want to use. Will they damage your car? Probably not, although I've definitely bought cheap electronics in the past that have been interestingly, as in computer destroyingly, interestingly wired. Will they damage you? In most cases, you'll be saved by other safety checks of the various connected electrical systems. Will they let out the magic smoke? Probably, and possibly pretty quickly. So look for reviews, check out the forums for the vehicle you own, and general EV forums, and ask people you trust. I love my open EVSE. It's performed perfectly from the day I built it, and our other EVSE, Mickey's old Siemens unit, is reliable if feature-free. Winter swears by his Clipper Creek, not at it, and Nikki's had really good luck with her juice boxes. To be totally transparent though, Nikki's newest juice boxes are long-term review units. So, you know how to find a decent one, you've worked out how powerful an EVSE you want, or you're just opting for the 32 to 40 amp that'll cover nearly everyone, what else factors into it? Well, if you're thinking about getting solar panels at some point, some EVSEs offer solar power integration, allowing you to default to limiting charging speed so it's only using energy coming off your solar panels. If that's the plan, take some time to think about how the parts of that system will work together. For us, at some point, we're hoping to lay our hands on some second-hand solar panels. We'll throw them on the roof and use Open Energy Monitor to integrate with our Open EVSE. Another possibility is that you might want to charge at night, so that you're taking advantage of a lower rate tariff. And if your car doesn't offer good charge timing integration, you need to make sure that your EVSE can do that. You might also, if you're very lucky, be in an area where they're doing trials of discounted charging rates if you allow the utility to delay charging. That allows the utility to balance supply and demand, and every case I've seen, you can override the delay if needed, but it allows you to take advantage of, again, discounted rates for your electricity because the utility supplier can ask you to pause or slow charging if demand is too high. For that to work, you'll need the right kind of EVSE. My local utility PSE recently did a trial involving the juice box chargers. Sadly, we only found out after the fact. And if, like us, you have a corporate spying device, 
I mean AI home assistant of some sort, then you might want your charging to integrate with that. Theoretically, our charger will integrate with Google, but I only half got it working and then I got distracted by some other shiny project. Ah, so if that is a feature that you really, really want, make sure the EVSE you buy is compatible with whatever boxen that you're using for home automation. Once you've picked out the features, manufacturer and specs, you should be good to go. Hunt out a good price. Local rebates as well. A lot of areas have rebates for the installation of EVSEs and sort yourself a reputable installer and you'll be charging away in no time. And look out for our next EV101 video on charging on the go. Is there anything we missed? Please let us know in the comments below and as always, play nice. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't yet as it makes sure that you don't miss out on our vids. And please do the same to our two other channels, Transport Evolved Take 2 and if you're in a hurry, Transport Evolved Shorts. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Andrew Martin, Guido Drujoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Raging Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month patron supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Ko-fi. Chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord. We're getting very close to our 1,000th Patreon and we've got some super cool ideas for how to celebrate. Thanks for joining me and as always, keep evolving.